with the invention of the telescope, people start building bigger and bigger telescopes. Until 18th, 19th century, uh, William Herschel comes along and he builds this very big telescope in South Africa. And this is the result. Uh, he is in South Africa. And meanwhile, in England, uh, someone has decided that uh, this is the kind of thing that he must have be seeing. So they actually publish in a newspaper that Herschel has discovered life on the moon. Um, times being what they were, this took a year or two to actually make clear that that was not what was being seen. Um, but this, I think this is a very nice picture. Uh, this is what people were thinking about when they were thinking about life on other planets. Um, unfortunately, Herschel's telescope uh, wasn't actually quite good enough to see this level of detail yet. Um, and that, um, but people were looking for life on the moon and on uh, other planets in the solar system. Uh, places like Venus, where with telescopes eventually it could be seen that Venus had a lot of clouds. So people were speculating at the beginning of the 20th century that maybe there was, under all these clouds, there was rainforests and swamps and all these other kind of, yeah, Earth-like environments. Um, unfortunately, that uh, when we got around to sending probes, that turned out not quite to be the case. Uh, the first probe that made it to the surface actually uh, died rather quickly. I think it lasted about eight minutes. Uh, because it was just so hot and there was sulfuric acid and it's a terrible environment for life. Uh, and it took another seven probes, I think, to get like proper data. Um, but people have been really looking at for life for a long time. And um, we've, these days we've sent probes to just about every planet in the solar system. And uh, we haven't actually found life yet, but we can also look outside the solar system. We can look for exoplanets. Uh, so these are the planets that I mentioned that are around other stars. And for a long time, this was just speculation. But then in 1990 uh, was the very first discovery of a planet uh, around the remnant of a long dead massive star. This is called a pulsar. Um, it's called that because it makes little beeping pulses and um, these are usually very regular, but when there's a planet, that gets disrupted a bit. And that was the very first confirmation that these other planets actually exist. So this is a very recent science. Um, of course, a long dead remnant of a star isn't very useful if you're trying to create life. Um, so the Nobel Prize this uh, spring actually went to the first exoplanet around a sun-like star. Uh, but this is actually the first exoplanet. And since 1990, we've kept looking for these exoplanets. And we have actually found quite a lot of them. As of this morning, there are 4,333 planets uh, that we have found outside of our solar system. And this picture you see here is some of the systems that have been discovered with the Kepler spacecraft. And you can see there's a lot of variety, right? There's big systems, small systems, big planets, small planets, lots of planets, single planets, there's all kinds of systems. And from this, we need to kind of filter down, uh, find the useful ones to start looking for life. And uh, a lot of these planets are discovered, like I said, with the Kepler mission and specifically with something we call transit method. Because planets are very far away, so it's very difficult to actually see them directly. It's much easier to uh, notice the effect that a planet has on the star. So as the planet is going around the star, it starts off kind of on one side, and you, if you're looking at it, you don't even see the planet, it's so faint. But you see the star, and then as the planet moves in front of the star, so between us and the star, that's the dot in the middle, uh, it's actually blocking part of the sunlight. And this makes the star appear less bright. And then it moves on again, and it moves away from the star again. And then we see the whole star, and it's really bright again. 
So during the orbit, every time the planet passes in front of the star, we see this little dip. And this dip is actually the best way we currently have of identifying exoplanets. Um, and of course, this, the size of this dip also depends a bit on the size of the planet. So very big planets are much easier to find than very small planets. Um, and unfortunately for us, small planets is kind of what we're looking for. If we're gonna find life like we have here on Earth, then our best bet is to look for an Earth-like planet. So preferably a planet that has water, is about the same size, and that has a surface. Because there are also planets like Jupiter, like Saturn, that are very big and very gassy, and they're called gas giants. But they're great big balls of gas. They don't have a solid surface. So we don't expect to find life there. So we really want these rocky planets. And I think the most famous Earth-like system is probably the TRAPPIST system. It was announced a few years ago. Um, and out of the 4,333 planets, uh, because small planets are so difficult to find, as of this morning, we have 197 Earths and super-Earths. Where super-Earths are planets like Earth, rocky planets, solid surface, but a little bit bigger, maybe two to three times bigger. Um, and then when you find a system like this, which has seven super-Earths in it, is an amazing find. And you think, like, this is really going to be it. But it's still not quite that simple, because you need a bit more than just a surface to be able to have life. So specifically, we're looking for planets in the habitable zone. And that means the area around a star where a planet can have liquid water on its surface. Um, because if a planet is too close to the star, then it gets really, really hot. So this is partially uh, what happens to planets like Mercury, where the star is so close and so hot that all the water uh, vaporizes. It becomes steam. And if it's close enough, even the whole atmosphere can boil away and you're left with just a bare rock, uh, which is not very good for life. And if we're too far from the star, if a planet is too far away, then there's not enough light, there's not enough warmth that reaches the surface, and you end up with a kind of snowball, which is also not very good for the development of life. So we're looking specifically uh, for planets in this habitable zone, this very narrow range uh, of where we think life might be possible. Um, and even that is uh, still not quite enough because uh, Venus, which is very much like the Earth, it's the same size, um, it's even in the habitable zone, but because of its very thick atmosphere, it holds on to a lot of the heat from the star and it's very, very warm. And there is no liquid water on Venus. So we need to know the temperature of the planet as well because of how the atmosphere affects uh, the surface temperature. And really the only way to do that at the moment is to try and take a direct picture of the planet. And this is called direct imaging. And the way it works is if uh, something is very hot, it emits light. So if something is red hot, it emits a bit of light. If something is white hot, it emits lots of light. And this kind of works on the same temperature and, or the same principle. And we're trying to measure the heat that is coming from the planet. Uh, unfortunately, this is very, very difficult. Like I mentioned before, it's, uh, the planet is very far away and the star is very bright. So if you're trying to imagine what it's to try and take a picture of a planet, think of this lighthouse. Now imagine it's about two kilometers away. And right next to the lamp, there's a little firefly. And you're trying to take a picture of this firefly. It's possible, but it's very difficult. And one of the ways we make it possible is uh, something called a coronagraph where we basically take a dark circle and we stick it in front of where the star is. That way we block the starlight and the planets uh, are a bit better visible. Um, 
So then you end up with something like this, where you see in the center there's this black area, that's where all the starlight has been blocked. And then you see the four dots that make up this planetary system. Uh, this is HR8799, it's kind of my personal favorite, uh, not least because it's actually been looked at for quite a few years already. And that means that if you look enough times over enough time, then you can actually make a video of how the planets are moving around the star. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately for us, it's the same thing as with the transit, where big planets have a lot of surface area, so they emit a lot of light. So all of these planets are actually even bigger than Jupiter. Uh, so we can see them, but they're still not very useful uh, if we're looking for life. We really need these Earth-like planets. And because these planets are so much smaller and so much fainter, uh, we need to up our equipment a bit. And that brings us to something that I have personally worked on, which is the NEAR instrument. Uh, this stands for NEAR New Earths in the Alpha Sen region. It's looking specifically at our nearest stars, which is Proxima and Alpha Centauri. And we have good reason to think that there is an Earth-like planet there. And this instrument uh, that you can kind of see in the bottom left uh, w was attached to the VLT, the Very Large Telescope, because like Francesca said, we're great at naming things. Uh, and with this eight meter telescope, uh, we took more than a hundred hours of observation and we found a little smudge that we're still not entirely sure whether it's a planet or not, but it's almost the first detection of an Earth-like planet uh, with this method. So with a little more time and a bit better technology, we can definitely get there. Um, and if you're wondering about the scale of this, you see this red circle on the side of the telescope. Uh, that's about the size of a person. So this is a pretty big thing. Um, but then, even if we find our Earth-like planet and we know what kind of temperature it has, uh, and we know that this is all habitable, we're still not quite there because just because life is possible doesn't mean it is there. Um, ah, right, yes. Uh, <laughs> if we uh, actually get light from the planet uh, while it's rotating on its axis, so while it's going from day to night, then we can actually apply some fancy mathematics and we can distinguish between different types of surface. So if you do that to the Earth, um, <clears throat> if you pretend that it's far away enough that you can't actually make out anything, then you can actually see some of the continents uh, from quite a distance. Uh, so you can see, for instance, Africa and the middle, uh, Asia and North America at the top. Um, but like I was saying, just because life is possible doesn't mean it is there. So we still need to find something that will tell us that life is definitely there. And this is what we call biomarkers for biology, life. Uh, these are the things that indicate that life is present. But that's also kind of easier said than done because what kind of things would prove the existence of life? You can't send a probe over or a camera because even the nearest star, it's going to take you more than four years if you're traveling at the speed of light to get there. And the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers a second. It's going to be a while before we reach that. Um, so we need something else, something we can tell from a distance. Um, maybe if we can tell what kind of molecules, atoms uh, are on this planet, we can say something, right? So the first thought maybe is organic molecules. So like, things like ribosomes, uh, what our DNA is made of, uh, these kinds of big organic carbon-based molecules. Um, unfortunately, it turns out that those are kind of present everywhere. They've been found in our solar system in places where there is definitely no life. So we need to keep thinking. Um, so what about oxygen and carbon dioxide? Since we're looking for life like us, we need oxygen to breathe. Uh, plants need carbon dioxide. We produce it. But unfortunately, it's not just life that produces these molecules. If you have a volcano, for instance, you get a lot of carbon dioxide as well. Um, 
Mars has the biggest volcanoes in the solar system, but there's no life there. So we need to somehow distinguish uh, the molecules that life produces from the molecules that are already there without life. And to do this, you can do a lot of uh, modeling of chemistry, uh, try and figure out what's happening on the atmosphere of, this, of these planets, what's happening on the surface. And then if you see way more oxygen than you would expect, or if you see way more carbon dioxide, um, then that will tell you that life is definitely there. So the best molecules for this is uh, oxygen and ozone, um, also methane, which when we're talking about life, it mostly comes from cows and things, uh, nitrogen oxides, that kind of thing. Um, but just then we still need to tell how do we know that it's there, right? Just because it's there doesn't mean we know it's there. And the way we look for these things is we take the light from a planet or a star and we kind of unravel it in all of its component colors. So this is called a spectrum. And then we look at how much light is coming from each color. And every molecule has its own kind of fingerprint. So if we uh, look at some examples uh, for Venus, for instance, you can see there's a lot of light in the middle and there's this dip where there's carbon dioxide. So this is kind of fingerprint. Every molecule has its own unique fingerprint. Uh, for the one Earth in the middle, you can see that there's water there, right? That's absorbing a lot of the light from this planet. And we can use this method to tell if these molecules are present and even to tell us how much of this molecule there is in the atmosphere. Um, and then also, if we're really looking for a very Earth-like life, we can look for plants, uh, because plants use sunlight to make their energy. They absorb light that they use for photosynthesis, and they absorb this light in a very specific wavelength range. So I've just put the rainbow under here uh, for context, so you know that a lot of the blue, green, yellow light is being absorbed. And then uh, when you reach the red, there's suddenly this big jump where the plants are no longer using up the light. So the, you can see a lot more of that color light. Um, this is called the red edge, and it's also one of the major biomarkers that we're actually looking for. Uh, unfortunately, it's already very hard with current equipment to even get a picture of a planet. So if we want to divide up all the light like this, we need a better instrument on a better telescope. And that better telescope is the ELT, or Extremely Large Telescope, because astronomers have not gotten any better at naming things. And this telescope is actually going to be 14 meters across. So that is five times bigger than the VLT, 25 times the surface area. Uh, those are very big numbers, so if you're not quite sure what to imagine, I have a comparison here with the Munich Allianz Arena, uh, because this is still technically a Munich event, even if everyone can join now. So this is, if you would put them next to each other, this is the relative size compared to a football stadium. So this is a big telescope, and with a very big telescope, we can get a lot more light, and we can actually start doing all of these things. So people are already thinking about, like, what are the best planets to look at and the best molecules to look for uh, <clears throat> so that when the ELT is here in 2023 we can start doing all of these things. Um, of course just because there's life that means maybe bacteria or something right maybe plants if you're lucky but what about intelligent life that's the what we really want to find is aliens, uh, intelligent life, uh, civilizations, that kind of thing. Of course, the first question is, how do we even define intelligent life? Uh, intelligence is kind of difficult to understand. It's a very complicated concept. Fortunately, uh, the people that do radio astronomy have come up with a very handy definition that we can all use, and that is that intelligent life is defined as life that can make radios. Um, so we basically, if you're looking for intelligent life, you're looking for radio signals. This is kind of very long wavelength light that can travel large distances, which is why we use it. And you use these kinds of telescopes uh, with these very big dishes uh, 
to try and look for it in space. And the idea is then that maybe a civilization like ours that uses radio a lot, um, you can pick up some of the residual signals, or maybe even there's a civilization out there that is actively trying to contact other people that is using radio to send messages uh, for the rest of us. Um, and of course, all of this is life within our own galaxy. Uh, because, like I said, everything is very far away, and that makes it very difficult. But it's at least all in our own galaxy, and if you're looking at other galaxies, then it's way further away. It's exponentially more difficult, and this is where we get kind of into the last few minutes sci-fi part of the talk, uh, more than actual science. Um, that is... Uh, something called a Dyson sphere or an alien megastructure. So the idea behind this is that as civilizations grow, they use more and more energy. And the more they grow, the more energy they need. And because resources on the planet are fairly limited, eventually the civilization will move into space and they will use the light and heat from their star to power their civilization. And the idea is that they would basically build this giant ball of solar panels around their star. So actually, if you're trying to look for the civilization and you're looking uh, at visible light, you're not gonna see anything, but it's still gonna be warm and there's still gonna be radio radiation. So you're, these civilizations would produce something that is dark, but has a lot of heat and radio. And then if you scale it up even further, these civilizations could move on to neighboring stars and they could do the same thing there. And then with the way stars move in the galaxy, uh, on a relatively short time scale, they could actually do this to an entire galaxy. This is why I mentioned this was kind of the sci-fi part of the talk. Um, so if you can find yourself a galaxy that is very dim in the visible light, but very warm with lots of radio radiation, then you can find an intergalactic civilization. Uh, <laughs> and that uh, kind of sums up all the different ways that we're currently and planning to uh, look for life. But I still haven't really touched on the most important bit, which is if we are looking for intelligent communicating civilizations in our galaxy, how many of these are there actually? Can we even come up with some idea of how many there should be? what are the odds of finding them? So I want to leave you with the Drake equation, and I know it says equation and math is scary, but uh, bear with me on this one. Um, the idea is to uh, try and see how many of these intelligent communicating civilizations there are in our Milky Way. Um, so that is the number n, that is the number that we're looking for. And uh, the astronomer Drake in the 60s came up with this equation, and I'll walk you through it. Um, the first thing that we have to think about is how many stars are there? What is the formation rate of stars in our galaxy? Um, and that is very roughly one star per year or a few hundred million uh, stars uh, in the galaxy. Uh, but we don't want just stars, right? We need planets. So Fp is the fraction of, or is the uh, odds that a given star has a planet. And on average, from what we can tell from all the ways that we're looking for planets, uh, there is very roughly about one planet for each star. So this is, again, a fairly well-known number. Um, then the next one is uh, an e, and that's the number of these planets that allow for life to exist. So planets that are Earth-like, that are in the habitable zone, that are the right temperature, all of that, that is in this number. Um, <clears throat> and this is a much smaller number, but we can still have a reasonable idea about it. Uh, and then it gets really difficult because the next one, FL, is the chance that life actually forms on one of these planets, which is 
very difficult because we only have one example of life forming and we're not entirely sure if that is the normal way of things or not. And then it gets even more complicated because then we have FI, which is the chance that that life that forms becomes intelligent. And then we get FC, which is the chance that that intelligent life is actually going to be able to communicate. Because if, even if we have a civilization, uh, we can't find it unless, we can unless they can communicate. If an alien is looking for life on Earth, it's going to be much harder to find the ancient Romans than it is to find us. And then the last factor is the lifetime of a civilization. So if we don't want to find a civilization that has stopped existing very long ago, then we need to take into account how long these civilizations last. Um, so the first few numbers are fairly well known. The last couple is complete guesswork, pretty much. Uh, and that is why the answer to this equation, a lot of people have looked at it, it's kind of a range of values based on best guesses. And that range is anywhere from a zero with nine zeros and then a one to about 10 million. Uh, so if you want something to think about in the next couple of days, then maybe you can consider what you think is the more likely number here. Thank you.